Hello and welcome back. My name is Dr. Christopher Gennari. This is Great Big History Podcast. In this episode, we continue our 101 History 101 lectures with India, war, politics, castes, and geography. Didn't see that one coming last, did you? So we start with geography. Aha, that's how you transition. There are two major rivers in northern India. I mean, there are many more rivers that come out of the Himalayas, and we'll talk about that. But in terms of early pre-Bronze Age Indian civilization, there are the big two, the Indus and the Ganges. The Indus runs north to south. It runs out of what is modern-day Afghanistan into what is modern-day Pakistan. Now, all of this, well, Afghanistan would have been considered Bactria, and part of Central Asia, whereas the Indus makes what is modern-day Pakistan part of India. You see Indus, India. India is named for the Indus. And it's the, the way, we'll get there, it's the way non-Indians came into India was following the Indus River. So the Indus runs north to south, the Ganges runs west to east and ends in the Bay of Bengal. So we have two major rivers, and if you're looking on the video, you can see they do not touch. They are actually separated by a desert, and they are located in the northern third of the subcontinent of India. That is going to have a profound effect on Indian civilization. And I know we are dealing with several countries. We are when I when I talk about India in the ancient world, I mean pretty much uh, modern Pakistan, modern India. Uh, really Sri Lanka is kind of included in that as part of the subcontinent even though it's an island. Uh, Nepal and Bhutan and Bangladesh. So we're going from the Iranian desert or the Indus River in the west to the jungles of Myanmar, of Burma in the east, and from the Himalayas to the sea. So we, we, when I say India, we mean the, the ancient geographical notion of that, not the modern countries of India, which the Indian subcontinent the British Raj, R-A-J as it was called, broke up in 1947. And in my 102 class, we talk about the horrors of that breakup. Um, Gandhi will be murdered. Uh, 10 million people get on the move. A million people are probably murdered. Um, it is a devastating ripping apart of a civilization that had been together since the beginning of this class. So, um, one of our big themes in our 102 class is the, the national and religious issues, tensions in India it is one of the themes of that class. But right now we're talking about geography. And so we have the Indus River and we have the Ganges. And we have two rivers in the northern third of the subcontinent. So what do these rivers do? Well, they do what rivers do. They give connection. The Indus, by going north to south, out of Afghanistan, out of Central Asia, gives in India its connection to Asia. If you want to come from Central Asia, you want to come from Persia, you want to come from the Caucasus, you have to hit the Indus River and then come south, follow it south into India. This is a big deal because this is how, this is what's called the conqueror's route. It's basically how Alexander will come in. It's how Darius will come in. It is how um, the Turkish uh, conquerors from Afghanistan will come. It is basically why, <laughs> it is basically why the United States was always going to lose the war in Afghanistan. That is coming to an end apparently now in 2011, 2011, 2021. 20 years after it starts. And the reason why is 
the modern country of Pakistan, but whoever it would have been needs to defend that invasion round. It needs to occupy it, needs to dominate it. Every major invasion of the Indian subcontinent comes through Afghan comes through southern Afghanistan. No matter who you are, whether you're the British Raj or or the um any of the Indian dynasties that controlled the subcontinent. You need to control Afghanistan. That's the way it is. So it's there's a book called uh, on Afghanistan called The Graveyard of Empires, and it's a stupid book because more empires start there. Alexander didn't lose. The Turks don't lose. Like, okay, the Russians lost. Sucks to be them. The British didn't lose. They lost two battles. They ended up conquering southern Afghanistan. Even the British didn't lose. They owned India for another hundred years. So, and the problem with that book is, is after 9-11, it became this famous book. Oh, this will tell the truth. And no, it, just take my freaking course, policy people. It's not. Take a history course. Don't read a book obsessed about the Russians in the 70s. Which is not really about Afghanistan, as much as it's about the Cold War. So, be that as it may. Back to geography. So, we have two, these two rivers connect northern India together. If you, you could travel, if you could cross that desert, which is a dry desert, don't get me wrong, but if you could take the couple of days to cross it, there are routes, you can go from Persia to Bengal. The two rivers connect or northern India together. They they allow for trade. They allow for information. They allow for the movements of people and money and goods. So what we get because of we have two huge rivers is we get agriculture. Agriculture gives us cities. Cities gives us trade. Trade gives us wealth. Wealth gives us knowledge. So what's the effect? The effect is northern India is always more advanced, more connected, more populous, more international, more cosmopolitan, more jacked into the world trade system than southern India. Southern India will always be more rural. It will always be poorer. It will always be more isolated because there's no, no way of going from northern India to southern India. It also means it's incredibly hard to unify people because there's no way to get from northern India to southern India. So we call it India, but for a lot of history, it's not. It's lots of little countries with lots of little kingdoms. It's not a united continent because there's no geography connecting it, which also means culture won't be united. We're going to talk about this. So, the second part of geography is the Himalayas. The highest mountain range in the world. They're the tallest mountains in the world. You can see them from space pretty easily. What does the tallest mountain range on Earth mean? It means it protects you against nomadic invasions. Nomads in Central Asia, which is right to the north, are going to skip India and head into the Middle East. Or hang a right and go into Russia. That's what the Mongols will do. Well, the Mongols will actually do both. There's only one invasion route, as we talked about, and that is through the Hindu Kush into Afghanistan, from Afghanistan down the Indus into what is modern-day Pakistan, and then you have to cross over to the Ganges. People will do this. Timur, the great conqueror from Persia, will do this. Mahmud will do this. So, again, if you want to protect the subcontinent, you have to dominate the Hindu Kush passes. 
So what does this protection mean? It means stability. It means wealth. It means trade. It means deep cultural roots. It also means a conservatism because you don't have to change. You don't have to deal with lots of other people. You don't have to deal with lots of outsiders. You don't have to deal with the trauma of invasion. The problem is it leads to isolation. You are cut off. And so they're usually behind other technologies. We'll see this with the Aryan invasion. We'll see this with many invasions. That despite the wealth, despite the stability, despite the, 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 enor the large population, despite all the advantages, India, even in the 21st century, is behind. And part of that is simply geography. It's simply the, the problem of geography. It, so ge the Himalayas are both a blessing and a curse. So India will be poorer, have less trade, and less connections than the Silk Road routes. India is of less importance than Mesopotamia and China to the world in the ancient world. Not today. Remember, we're not talking about to 2021. We're talking about 5000 BCE. And you go, well, how can you say that, Professor? And I go, well, because India had a Bronze Age civilization that even India forgot it had. That's how devastating the Bronze Age collapse was. But there's no memory of it in Mesopotamia or Egypt. It existed. It was flourishing. It was rich. It was connected to world trade. And it disappeared. And no one seemed to notice. So... India will become massively important when the Europeans get on their ships. Columbus and the Gama may want to have gone to China, but Columbus thought, quote unquote, he had hit, he had ended, you know, he wanted to go to India too. That's why he names Indians, Indians. But Vasco de Gama's goal was to make it to India and he made 4,000% profits. A 400% profits, excuse me. So trade with India was a major goal of, of Europeans in the early modern period, in the 15, 1600s. So it's why Britain will spend two centuries and a whole lot of history and a whole lot of cultural capital and a whole lot of effort to control the subcontinent. And then to make it into a Asiatic version of Britain, or try to anyway, for good and for ill, and for a lot of violence. So, as you can see, this this uh, this class is is not a clean experience of national culture. There's a lot underneath the surfaces, and I'm trying to be sensitive to all of that. So, while also talking about how things were in 5000 BC. So, what is the Indian imperial experience? India is so old. The Indian subcontinent is so old. Remember, this includes Bengal, this includes um, Bangladesh, includes Pakistan, includes really southern Afghanistan to a lesser extent. Um, Nepal and Bhutan. So, what is it like? It is so old, we can see patterns. Well, we start with one India. We do get a united India. The subcontinent gets united from time to time. Yes. So, there are times when you can sail, can you can show up on the Indus, and there is a, quote, India that stretches from the Himalayas to the sea, from the Indus to Bengal. Well, that India breaks up. It can't be held together very long, and it breaks up. A century, maybe two, is usually what we're looking at of a united India. It breaks up. And now remember what I talked about, about how northern India and southern India aren't connected, and how that leads to a lot of cultural differences you know, one is more urban, one is more rural, one is more tied to world trade, one is more 
uh, isolated and local in its trade. One is more more um, international, and one is more subcontinent. Well, that leads to differences in language. That leads to differences in religion. That leads to differences in beliefs. That leads to differences in food and what you eat. And so people 100 miles away from each other are living completely different cultural lives. They're reading different books. They're worshiping different gods or different versions of the same gods. Though what we'll see in Hinduism is, is, is you can have lots and lots and lots of gods. Right? There's no problem with that. And so that cultural breakup is what's happening here. When India breaks up, it's breaking up along those cultural, like, like a windshield cr breaking into those little pellets. It breaks up into similar lines every time. And those big pieces then break up even more. As you get more local, more, more isolated, you get less international. When the British arrived in India, they had some 3,000 kings, rajas to deal with. That's how much India had broken up. Now, you look at the map of Germany and go, oh my God, Germany is a mess when it had 300 Germany had 300 um, dukes. They didn't call themselves kings because there was a king, but that king didn't have a lot of power. So there's all these dukes, but they're they're essentially independent. They were they were essentially kings. Anywhere else, they would have been kings. India had 3,000. India is bigger. India has more people, but India was also much more divided along cultural and geographic lines. So you could imagine putting India back together is extremely hard. It's like Humpty Dumpty fell down and broke, and then all of it, the all the king's men and all the king's horses jumped up and down on Humpty Dumpty over and over and over again to break him into lots of little pieces. That's that's India. And you're living in this period, by the way. You are living in this period. The subcontinent was united in 1945. From the Indus to Bengal, from the Himalayas to the sea. It was one country. It was the British Raj. It was a colony. It was imperialist ownership. So it was run by British white people. Good or not, and there's, in our 102, we will do both sides of that because the British will talk about, you know, we get Kipling and we get the white man's burden. We get all kinds of stories about how this is a good thing. But we also have Gandhi and Nehru and we also have the great heroes and we have the the Indians who are like, we're conquered, what, WTF? So there's, you know, the colonial experience is something we talk about in 102. But it was one kingdom. It was one Raj, R-A-J. 1947, it broke up. And it broke up into Pakistan, India... Nepal, Bhutan, Sri Lanka. So it broke up into Pakistan, India, Bhutan, Nepal, Sri Lanka. Five pieces, right? Then what happened? Then in the 60s or in the 70s, Pakistan broke into two pieces. Now it was separated. It was East and West Pakistan. And East Pakistan became Bangladesh. It revolted. It wasn't treated very well. It had a revolution. It India got involved. It becomes its own country. Boom. Um, Afghanistan, which is separate but part of this, also becomes its own country. It's a different, uh, different history, but it also becomes its own country. Pakistan breaks up into two countries, right? Sri Lanka has a civil war. It effectively broke into two countries for two years. Uh, two years, 20 years, excuse me. And right now you're living in, a, in an Afghanistan that's essentially broken into half. Southern Afghanistan and Northern Afghanistan are completely different places. And even Pakistan has been falling apart into little um, semi-independent parts. 
the Pashtuns in the north effectively run their own country. They have their own borders. They have effectively kicked out the Punjabs of the south. So does are there Pakistani federal judges up there? No. Police? No. Courts? No. It's effectively run by these local militias. And so we're you're living in a world where the subcontinent continues to break up into more and more pieces. So how do we get one India again? Well, that's a foreign invasion. We do live in a world where there's an India. And we do live in a, in a history where India is recreated. And who recreates it? Foreigners. Foreigners recreate a united India. There is one exception, and even that exception has an asterisk to it. And we're going to actually talk about that exception. So, and we have to talk about that asterisk. So, but the idea is foreigners come in and smush. That might be the Turks from Afghanistan. That might be uh, the Persians on the Timur. That might be, might be, might be. The British is the most famous, most recent example. But basically, outsiders look at India and say, it's huge. It's got all this money. It's got all this stuff. If someone could just put it together, they would get rich. That was Alexander's goal. Having conquered the Indus or helped conquer the Indus, I should say. I mean, he didn't conquer the Indus. He had plenty of allies. He got involved in Indian politics. He's then told, oh, the Ganges exists. Why don't you conquer that too? And he said, is the Ganges as rich as this? And they're like, oh, easily, if not more. Alexander's like, let's go. And his, his Greek and Macedonian troops said, no, I'm going home. And they turned around and left. Like, you could go. We're leaving. So, the Indian imperial experience, every couple hundred years this happens. One India, it breaks up into pieces. Those pieces break up into even more, more isolated pieces along cultural lines. And then, sooner or later, a foreigner comes in, invades India, usually through the Hindu Kush, he conquers and he reunites most of the subcontinent, making, quote-unquote, India again. And then the process begins again. A hundred years later, it breaks up. It break can, Over the next hundred years, it breaks up into even more pieces. And then a hundred years after that or so, a foreigner invades and puts it back together. The first foreign invader that we have is the, is the Aryans. Now, these are not the Hitler Aryans. These are the actual Aryans. But... It's a complicated thing I can't get into. We don't have time for it. But if you have a question about why Hitler calls German people Aryans, you basically, the, the answer I'm going to give you is that race theory in 1905, white people were crazy. That's just the way I'm going to tell you. When it comes to race in 1905, White people be crazy. And it's just, it's a complicated thing and I can go into it and I've done it in classes and students look at me and they all look the same way. They go, that's crazy. And I go, yes. In 1905, when it came to racism, white people be crazy. And so those theories get inputted into a young Hitler and young German Nazi group and nationalists in the in the 19 teens into the 1920s and boom flourish as Nazi part of the nationalism of Nazism in the 1940s. You can look it up on Wikipedia why Hitler calls why the, the Nazis call Germans Aryans. They're not but it's it's about the caucuses being white people and the whitest white people. It's, I, I'm getting into it. It's just white people be crazy. That's it. And so during 1000 BC, during the Bronze Age collapse, the Aryan Aryans get on the move. Now, they are coming out of the Caucasus. They are chariot warriors. Now, they're also coming out of the Caucasus, so they are, like, you can't kind of hide this, they are white people. They are Caucasian. 
They are the original Caucasians. They are coming out of the Ma Caucasus Mountains. Is, it makes you Caucasian. And w why white people are called Caucasian goes back to the 1905 white people be crazy. It's just the way it is. So... Now, why does that matter? That will matter. Their skin color doesn't, it does matter. I can't say it doesn't because it does. Even though the ancient world is not racist, the in ancient world did not apply quality, personal quality to the color of your skin. The color of your skin did not make you a better or a worse person. Your culture did. So are you an Aryan or are you not? But it would be remiss of me to say that when the Aryans conquer India, they foreign conquerors, they come through the Hindu Kush, they come down the Indus, they have their chariots, they have their superior technology, they conquer India, that the fact that they were lighter skinned than the people they were conquering, it did matter because it will matter in the caste system because it will allow people at sight to determine, are you a native Indian or are you an Aryan? And so the segregation of the caste system has a racial component to it. it. There's no way, even though I will tell you there is no racism until the 1500s, there just isn't, even though people will bring up these other ideas and they'll say, well, what about this and this and this? And they'll say, yes, people hated each other. Yes, but they didn't have place values on it. That all of those things that are cited are differences, that they are different people. But remember, um, for all the stuff uh, Shakespeare talks about in Othello, about his appearance, about the color of his skin, Othello is the more. He's a Muslim in Christian Venice. Does his skin color make him different? Yes. Does his facial features make him different? Yes. Does Iago use those differences against Othello? Yes. But remember, he's the Moor. It's the culture. So the Aryans conquer India. They use their superior technology of the chariots. They are chariot warriors. They conquer India. And so what they start to do is change the the Indian culture that they've conquered with their foreign ideas. They bring in their foreign ideas. They won the war. They say, hey, we're in charge now. We're going to live how we live. You people can do what you want, but you probably should take on our culture. And so what happens is Aryan warrior gods get adopted into the Indian settled institutions and we get Hinduism. Not modern Hinduism. It's ancient Hinduism, but we get the beginnings of Hinduism, which is this melding of two different methodologies. Warrior gods on the move. And if you know your Vedas, you know that's all warrior gods. A lot of those come originally from the Aryans. But the practice, see, the Aryans are, are mobile people. They're on the move. They're nomadic. Well, they're, they don't start as nomadic. They're, it's Bronze Age collapse. They've been forced from their homes. So they can't set up temples. They can't set up books. They don't have holy books and all that. India has that because they're settled, they're stable. And so selling now you'll get Aryan warrior gods with temples, with priesthoods, with ceremonies. And it's that melding of the two. How do the Aryans gain legitimacy? By this unification of foreign and native culture. They are too small in India to obliterate Indian culture or Indian people. And so there's this unification. So you get the Vedas, V-E-D-A-S, warrior tales of the gods. It's this relationship between people in the universe. It's trying to understand who people are in a world of war. These are warriors. The Aryans are warriors. Their gods are warriors. So their stories are war stories. But there's a demographic problem. The Aryans are few. The Indians, the native Indians, are many. And so their answer to this is the caste system. 
to separate people by job. L- segregation. To literally break people up by job. Now, you know the Aryans are going to have the best jobs because they conquered India. They're on top, right? So we're going to talk about that in a second. But that's the way of doing it. Because if you let... Look. The Aryans are chariot warriors. So they're hot, right? They got big biceps from holding their horses, right? They got big thighs from like cyclist thighs, from being being stable on on the platform of the chariot, right? They got ripped abs from holding themselves, from being tight, holding themselves in place. They got a strong back, right? That's the driver. The guy next to him who's going to shoot the bow or throw the spear is equally hot and ripped, right? And athletic. These are are like modern Marines, modern army. These guys are hot. And now that they've conquered India, they've got money. Well, are there hot Indian women? Yes. So what happens when you put hot Indian women and hot Aryan men together? You get super hot babies. Now, normally you'd say that's not a problem. That's good. You want super hot babies. That's actually a problem if you're the Aryans. Why is it a problem? Because there's not enough of you. So if you mix, if you let your super hot men and your sexy ladies marry native Indians, even just the super hot ones, of which there are plenty because India has a much larger population. Remember, they're natives to India. So they're going to be a bigger population than the settlers. If you just let them mix with the super hot people, you will disappear. So you go from 100% Aryan marrying 100% Indian. Well, you marry, what are your kids? 50% Aryan. Well, if they marry an Indian, now it's 25%, and then it's 12%, and then 6%. And at 6%, you don't see the Aryanness in them anymore. And so the Aryans are terrified of being bred out. It's the opposite of what happened to the 10 tribes of Israel. They lost, and so they got spread out by both the Assyrians, but then later the Judeans got spread out by both the Babylonians and then later the Romans. And the idea was, you will marry Romans, you will marry Assyrians, and in a hundred years, your culture will disappear because your kids will marry local people and their kids will marry local people. And in a hundred years, they won't remember what it was like to be an Israelite or to be an Aryan. This is what white nationalists in America are terrified of. That in 1960, white people were 85% of the population. Now they're 60% of the population 50 years later. So they're terrified. Like it was illegal for black men and white women to get married until like the 1967. Barack Obama's parents' marriage was illegal in something like 11 states in the country when he was born. Because racists were terrified that white people would disappear. There's a theory now about white replacement theory and and the guys who go into mosques and shoot them up and kill 20 people all have it in their manifestos. They also all have plans for making white women into... um, breeding programs like the handmaid's tale so the aryans have view this as a problem that their culture will disappear they are too outnumbered they are a minority in india so what do they do they create the caste system to separate people by job so Um, In a simplified form, we have the princes at the top, we have priests and warriors at equal, we have Aryan landlords underneath them, and then there is a hard line. Do not pass go, do not collect $200. You cannot go above that line. Now, are there probably historical examples of individuals who do? Sure, why not? It's no, no no wall is ever 
um, 100%. Most walls actually aren't. But that's the idea. Is there was a hard line. The Aryans are at the top. And then there's a hard line. And then there's native laborers. And underneath them are the natives that even native laborers don't want to associate with. And those are people outside of caste. They don't belong to a caste. They have no people. They do jobs nobody wants to do. They do the filthy jobs. They do jobs like sanitation. They do jobs like undertakers. They do jobs like they deal with poop and death. That's what they deal with. Butchers. And you go, well, those are good middle class jobs. And you go, yes, today where we have soap. Imagine it's 3000 BCE and you're cleaning out a sewer and there's no soap. Do you want your daughter marrying that guy? And the answer is no. So outcast literally means outside the caste because the British would show up in India and say, who are these people? Why are they treated so terribly? And they're like, what caste do they belong to? They're like, oh, they don't belong to any caste. So they're outside the caste system? Yes. So to be an outcast is to be kicked out of the system as a whole. And who? so they create a caste by being outcasts because the only people they can marry are each other. Now, so we have the princes, the priests, the warriors, the Aryan landlords, a hard line, native laborers, and then the hard line, and then the outcasts, right? But even these are broken up. So let's go look at our warriors. Even our warriors are levels one, two, three, four, and five. And they're separated into ranks. So a warrior level three, and this is the importance of how this works. A warrior level three goes to the first grade. So I am, I am, my father is a warrior level three. So that makes me a warrior level three. So we have a decent life. We have a good life, right? Our life is better than the Aryan landlords who own the land, right? But it's not as good as the princes, right? But also it's better than level four or five, but not as good as one or two, right? So we're driving Hyundai Elantras while level two is driving the Sonatas, right? Level one is driving the Genesis. So my father is a warrior level three, which means I am a warrior level three. So what happens? I go to preschool. I go to the first grade and I walk into the first grade and who's in that class? Warrior level threes. In fact, I'm in the warrior level three school. In classes, warrior level threes, right? Who's in that class? In that class, when I walk in, is my future best friend and my future girlfriend and my future prom date, my future wife, maybe. And I hope you start to see what the advantage of the caste system is, why people will keep it for the next 2,000 years. But in that first grade, so which means... All of my friends are in my class together. I will go to school with them the entire time, right? I will hang out with warrior level threes. When I go to prom, my date will be a warrior, the daughter of a warrior level three. When I join the bowling league, I will bowl on Wednesdays, warrior level three night in the warrior level three league. I will hang out. My best friend will be a warrior level three at my wedding. I will marry a warrior level three, the daughter of a warrior level three, but all of my best men, my best man will be a warrior level three. All of my homeboys are warrior level threes. When we go on vacation, we hang out as warrior level threes at a warrior level three hotel and resort and spa. And when I die, I will be buried. I will actually be burned, but my, I will be mourned by warrior level threes who I have known my entire life. There's the advantage. If I need money, I've got people I have known since the first grade who can, bar, who can loan me some money. If I need childcare, hey, me and the wife want to take a vacation. We just want to go away for five days to Delhi and go see some cool stuff. Can you take my kids and just watch them for a little while? Of course we can. And who are those people? Warrior level threes. Who I have known my entire life. 
So comradeship in Indian society is huge because the entire cultural society of the caste um, forces it. You have, you know who your best friend is going to be. Maybe not individually, but it's a warrior level three. So you never have to worry about that. You know, like you say, oh, you know, in high school, when you're all together, but then you separate, not in India, not in the caste system. In the caste system, you're together. So what is the advantage? The advantage is people get stability, predictability, and community. They know their future job. I will be a warrior level three. I know who my friends are going to be. My spouses are going to be. My kin are going to be. Because I'm going to be, my spouse is going to be a daughter of a warrior level three. All of her brothers are warrior level threes. And my life won't get worse. No matter what happens, I will be a warrior level three. I can't go into poverty. I can't lose my status. Remember we talked about Rome and the loss of dignity? That can't happen in the caste system. What does society get out of this? Because remember, society is creating this. So individuals get all this stability and predictability in a world that is harsh and poor. So this is huge. This is why, this is the attraction of the caste system. And let's, let's also face this as an aside. We have caste systems too in America. Most people who go to Harvard are the daughters or sons of people who went to Harvard. In the military, more than 50% of the people joining the military are related to someone who's already been in the military. You know, we, gain, we have the same situations. Certain jobs, certain professions. So my brother worked on Wall Street in a place where he was known as the Italian because Italians were very rare. Can you imagine in New York, Italians being rare in any job? But he was. So there are, even in America, we funnel people. We talk about how, I mean, look at me. My father was a teacher. I'm a teacher. So... That's not quite the cast, but it's not that far away from it either. So we have our casts, we just hide them a little better. And we talk about meritocracy. But, you know, that's not very clear how meritocratorious we are. But the advantage of the cast is its stability. It's why people like it. It's why, why individuals, why families go into it. What does society get out of it? It gets a predictable labor supply. It gets stable social order. It knows how many warrior level threes it's going to have in 20 years. And if there's not enough, it can do something about it. It can give incentives for people to have more kids. It can actually promote people in some ways. Um, so there's always movement, but there's never, there's never, it's not, it's not bone dry in terms of movement. That's all like fossilized, but it's not a lot of movement and re and you have to, and if you know anything about new money, those new people moving in are never going to be accepted the same way the old guard is. So someone who's like given a stamp to like, be a new level warrior level three. When his kid shows up in the first grade, he's going to be like, ew, you were a level four. Ew. Like who's going to want to date him? Right? Someone who doesn't have a lot of other prospects is what happens. So, so this works. The caste system has enough stability and predictability in it that it works i'm not saying it makes everybody happy i'm no, notice i never use the word happiness but it works 
And for 2,000 years, it has legitimacy within Hindu Indian society. What is its disadvantage? Well, its disadvantage is, as, as an American you should probably see, is it doesn't fulfill people's desire for better, to move up. You cannot be a warrior level three and end up as a warrior level one on your own. The basic idea of why be a warrior level three when warrior level two is better. I should be a warrior level two. I can move up. I'm better than some of those guys. They're lazy. I'm hungry. I can do it. I could do the job better than them, right? I'm smarter. I'm faster. And so there's, yes, in the ancient world, conservatism works. Conservatism is the way, but that doesn't mean that it's fossilized. It doesn't mean that people being conservative don't want a better life either. You know, women want to marry better men. Men want more honor. This is something the Romans were very good at. At least the Roman Republic was excellent at, of finding ways of promoting people. The triumph, the parade, the Senate, then renaming. Scipio goes from Scipio Aemilianus to Scipio Africanus, which is way cooler. The caste system doesn't allow for that. The caste system, by protecting people from moving down, does not help them move up. So you need a solution to that. People need a solution. Otherwise, the entire system would have cracked eventually. We are going to talk about that solution. We're going to talk about people's beliefs. We're going to talk about society. We're going to talk about samsara and karma in our next lecture. So be safe. Take care. Thank you.